Hello, everyone, and welcome to season three of The Matrix, Conversations and Transformations. This is a seminar series from the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice uh, in Los Angeles, California, that features innovative experts, scholars, artists, and activists. Uh, I'm Professor Caroline Heldman. I'm the chair of the CTSJ department, and I am joined by my co-organizer of The Matrix, Professor Malik Moaz Amdolat. Today, we are absolutely overjoyed to be joined by a legend at Occidental College, 1980 alum, uh, Steve Call, to discuss the current situation in Afghanistan and put it in historical context. Uh, before I pass the baton to Professor Moazam Dolat, I wanna just talk about a couple of things that are coming up on the matrix. The first is next week, uh, we are interviewing Prabhleen Kaur Lamba, who is a high school senior who has already written a book about social justice and sports and her activism in that arena. And then the following Thursday, um, we have two events. The first is a panel discussion on the status of women in Afghanistan. We will be joined by a number of high profile people, uh, Dr. Frida Jalalazai, Professor of Political Science and the Associate Dean of Global Initiatives and Engagement at the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences at Virginia Tech. We will also be joined by Dr. Mona Jahali, who is an Associate Professor of International Relations and Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies. She is also the Director of Human Rights uh, in, in the Middle East Studies Program uh, at Agnes Scott College in Georgia. And last but not least, Dr. Wida Mahran of Exeter University in England, whose area of expertise is Afghanistan with a focus on warlordism, conflict, and peace building. So that is our noon uh, session. And then we have an evening session where we are hosting a nonprofit called the Debt Collective. Uh, they work to uh, reduce the harms of debtor capitalism and they run programs to cancel student debt, housing, and carceral debt. And one housekeeping note, uh, you can submit your questions at any time in, in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will get to those questions at the end of the program. And now I will pass the baton to Professor Dr. Moazam Dolat. Thank you. So to begin with, let me just say that the event is being co-sponsored by the McKinnon Center for Global Affairs. So very special thanks to its director, Professor Derek Shearer. Also the Young Initiative on Global Political Economy and its director, Professor Anthony Chase and the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Okay, so let me introduce our distinguished guest here. Dean Steve Cole is a staff writer at The New Yorker, the author of eight books of nonfiction and a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Between 1985 and 2005, he was a reporter, foreign correspondent and senior editor at The Post, Washington Post. There he covered Wall Street, served as the paper South Asia correspondent in New Delhi, and was the Post's first international investigative correspondent based in London. So he first served as managing editor for the Post between 98 and 2004. The following year, he joined The New Yorker, where he's written on international politics, American politics, and national security, as well as intelligence controversies in the media. Um, Cole is the author of a number of books, two of which have meant a great deal to me. The first is Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan, Bin Laden, from the Soviet Invasion to September 10th, 2001. It was published in 2004, and he won an Overseas Press Club Award and the Pulitzer Prize for that one. In 2008, he wrote a book called The Bin Ladens, which won the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for nonfiction in 2009, and he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for biography for that one. He wrote a book called Private Empire, Exxon Mobil and American Power, which won the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Award as the best business book of 2012. And his most recent book, Director at S, which I was saying uh, to uh, Steve uh, messed with my mind, uh, is called Director at S and it won the National Book Circles Award for nonfiction. He has four children and is married to Eliza Griswold, the journalist and poet. He has a BA in English and history from Occidental College in case you're wondering what to do, what you can do with a liberal arts degree. Okay. So welcome, Steve. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's so wonderful to have you. Um, Professor Heldman, you want to start us off with a, with a question? Yeah, Steve, in the past two weeks, in the wake of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, we've seen uh, the Taliban really quickly seize power throughout the country. Uh, some people were uh, surprised by that, others less surprised. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of Biden's handling of uh, what happened in the past two weeks. Can you give a bit of, uh, of history about why it happened so quickly and given the investments in Afghan military and government over the past 20 years? Well, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an important question and a large one. Let me just take a couple of pieces of it. One is um, obviously the the state building project that the United States and its allies embarked on after 2001 um, failed uh, under pressure um, after a long war. The war was stalemated for a long time uh, between the United States led NATO coalition and its Afghan allies on the one side and the Taliban on the other. War was stalemated really from the time the Taliban came back about 2006 up until this year. And it was in military terms, it was stalemated for a specific reason, which was that the US had a monopoly on air power in the conflict and the Taliban had no answer for air power. And so every time the Taliban would mass try to attack a city, uh, the US and its allies would bomb them essentially. Uh, and so the Taliban, controlled a lot of the countryside uh, and a lot of the roads and a lot of the nighttime, uh, but the American-led uh, coalition held the cities for an awfully long time. Uh, when the Biden administration, for reasons we can discuss later, having inherited a very flawed negotiation from the Trump administration, decided uh, that it was time to go, um, I think the decision that was announced in April um, you know, obviously it had a psychological effect on a lot of the um, the Afghan government and, and security forces, but it also had a practical effect. Um, the attempt to hand off this advantage that the NATO forces had held for so long, this air power advantage just didn't work. The US pulled all of its contractors out and the Afghan Air Force was just not in a position to pick it up. Uh, so I think a lot of Afghan soldiers and officers recognized that they had lost their winning weapon in the war. Uh, and so they decided um, to uh, protect themselves by essentially either melting away or changing sides. The last thing I would say is that if you look back at Afghan, you know, kind of the conflicts that that began after the Soviet invasion and that have been exacerbated by outside interventions one after another, the American intervention, you know, Soviet invention, Pakistan's multiple interventions. Uh, you know, the pattern is that a lot of great powers and regional powers have sought their own security by choosing sides in the Afghan civil war uh, and by exacerbating that war. Um, and um, Afghans themselves, uh, who you know had lived in a peaceful, if um, uh, not wealthy, polyglot for most of the 20th century. You know, having suffered through all of this conflict, um, in response to pivot points in that war, many times they have simply made their own decisions to switch, uh, to switch sides in order to prevent bloodshed. Um, so, what we've seen happen that is described in the United States as a rapid, unexpected intelligence failure, a collapse of the Afghan state is really just a, is, is a, another in a series of essentially collective Afghan decisions to protect themselves by switching sides when it seemed to them that the war was lost. And I, I, was, I went into that digression about air power because that's why they saw the war was lost. They saw that the stalemate was broken, that the Taliban could not be contained the way they had been. And so it wasn't like a collapse of, you know, in the Ameri in the United States, we often see this as like a collapse of psychology. Of course, that was a factor, but there was a practical reason why Afghans correctly perceived that the war had changed and that they needed to get on the right side of this war really quickly. That happened in November of 2001 when the U.S. led coalition invaded the country. The Taliban collapsed and very suddenly melted away, much faster than people predicted. And it's happened at other instances of this much too long war going back to 1979. That's very helpful. That's that 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 air power point's a great one. Um, let's maybe talk about the the Taliban and its um, the way it's functioning. So, how is it the Taliban has remained so difficult to defeat or deter? Um, and I think you've pointed out a number of times uh, in interviews and in your writing despite, so that difficult to defeat and deter, despite the fact that um, we've heard over and over again how they've been deeply degraded in with regard to their power or that they were desperate. So that's the first part of my question. Uh, why? Are, how is it that they've been able to stick around so long? And another part of this goes to uh, your book, Director at S, which is what's the role of Pakistan's ISI or intelligence service in that? 
And then we can get, there's a third element of that, which is I think people conflate the Taliban and Al Qaeda and ISIS. We can get, you know, we take those in whatever way you want. All right. So let's let, will you come back to the third one? Because that is, yes. I think, a different question. The first two questions are an important one. The first two questions are really related to one another. So, uh, one reason why the Taliban insurgency has been successful is that it has enjoyed a sanctuary in Pakistan, um, it has enjoyed a physical sanctuary, also a headquarters for its political and military leadership. Um, uh, hospitals to treat its wounded, uh, training grounds uh, to prepare for the next season of its campaigns. And I think political scientists um, studying insurgencies have demonstrated pretty persuasively the way political scientists do with their data that um, insurgencies that have physical sanctuaries uh, tend to last a lot longer than insurgencies that don't. Um, so, you know, you can take the ideology out of it. It's a structure. If, you have, if you're an insurgency, you want a safe zone where you can go back and refit and recruit. And if, by the way, as is the case in Pakistan, um, you, have an, you have a safe area that is also a recruiting ground because it's filled with refugees and young men who are growing up who you can persuade to join. Then you're you're even more advantaged. So, um, yes, the state of Pakistan also has taken a deliberate policy decision to foster this sanctuary and to actively aid the Taliban, because Pakistan sees its own security um, as strengthened. It's complicated, but broad strokes, they have tried to push their border forward into Afghanistan. Uh, through these militias, including the Taliban, going back to the early 90s. So the Taliban have stuck around because Pakistan has allowed them to stick around and also because they've enjoyed their kind of independent sanctuary. And then the third point to make is that the Taliban are part of Afghanistan. They are indigenous. They, um, they, they grew up organically out of the armed resistance to the Soviet occupation in the 1980s. Um, they were not particularly, the group that now leads the Taliban, they were not a particularly favored client of the CIA during the anti-Soviet covert action. They were a, kind of a marginal uh, part of the war. They were based in Kandahar, which was really never the main theater of the Soviet war. But they became uh, fired by the ideology that brought um, a lot of uh, regional and international radicals into the fight against the Soviet Union. They were educated at madrasas that sprung up along the border. And then they developed a very you know, specific interpretation of radical political Islam tied back to the Diobandi school in India that they made their creed. And once they emerged in the 90s and took over the country, uh, you know, they enforce that that creed. So I, I don't want to say that the Taliban's ideology is sort of indigenous to Afghanistan. It's not. Um, it was something that they learned literally across the border and, and from an international stream of thinking about radical Islam. But the Taliban themselves and their claims to justice and righteousness in rural Afghanistan and in Southern Afghanistan. Yeah, they're part of the landscape. That's why it was a huge missed opportunity after the Taliban Emirate fell in 2001 to reject their attempts to enter into Afghan politics, right? So the, the Bush administration made no distinction. Now we're heading towards your other question, made no distinction between the Taliban and Al Qaeda at a time when Afghans recognized the Taliban as part of their own country. Uh, you know. It's the same thing with every defeated military force. Think of you know, the United States after the Second World War. You, you can't hold the entire population that you've just uh, defeated accountable for the war crimes of its leaders. So yes, okay, you may wanna have war crimes trials for the Nazi and Japanese leadership, but you're going to try to incorporate as much of the population as possible into the recovery for the sake of stability and peace. And this was, also an equation in Afghanistan in 2002 when the Taliban were defeated and they wanted a place in the, po in the next, some of them did. Um, and, and the Bush administration essentially shipped them off to Guantanamo as uh, its response and made clear to the Taliban that if they wanted a place in the future of Afghanistan, they would have to fight for it. And that's what they did. 
Steve, did you want to jump into the difference between the groups? That was the follow-up question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. Let's start with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, because this has bedeviled uh, the American war really since the beginning. Uh, well, certainly since 2002, 2003. Um, the United States has really struggled to develop a consistent answer to the question and, and, and a plausible answer to the question. Um, are the Taliban an enemy of the United States? And if, and if they are an enemy of the United States, um, you know, do we have to use all of our power to defeat them? And what does defeat look like when they're an insurgency of this sort? So I just mentioned the problem of recognizing the political opportunity early on. That's certainly one missed opportunity, but much later when the, when the Obama administrations uh, inherited the war, uh, and the president came in and was trying to struggle with um, what to do. And, um, you know, he commissioned a number of interagency reviews about his options. The military was advising him to go big. Uh, there, there was a kind of clock ticking, they said, Mr. President, you got to act quickly. Uh, the president slowed down and tried to have a discussion. And one of the, one of the issues that really um, plagued their deliberations, and I think unsettled the president, was uh, this distinction between al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Uh, the president's sort of view was, look, we're in this war because of al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda attacked us on 9-11. They attacked us from Afghanistan. They are still present in the region, and they are still launching attacks, not um, as successfully as 9-11, but they're still very active. They're mostly in Pakistan, but they're also straddling the border with Afghanistan. That is the purpose of our war. The reason I'm escalating is because of Al Qaeda. And his message was, our mission is not to defeat the Taliban. Um, we are only at war with the Taliban to the extent that, that that is necessary to achieve our goals against Al Qaeda. Now, Al Qaeda, just for definition's sake, not taking for granted what people, you know, how much people have gone into the weeds on this. I mean, Al Qaeda is a non-Afghan organization, right? It was started by um, a, a collection of Egyptian and Saudi radicals in a border city of Pakistan in 1988. It grew into a multinational um, sort of vanguard, millenarian uh, sort of uh, group with ambitions to strike at the United States under some theory about how the US would then instantly collapse and so on. It's a small group uh, distinguished by a couple of things that never sought to govern territory. It never sought like uh, Hezbollah or Hamas to combine um, you know, revolutionary or um, um, you know, re revanchist ambitions with public services. No, Al Qaeda was a small uh, vanguard. It had a theory of revolutionary sort of vanguardism to go back to the kind of Bolshevik <laughs> era. Um, and so, and it's primarily led by, it has primarily been led by, um, by Egyptians and Saudis. Uh, and it's attracted a coalition from many other places as well. The Taliban are an indigenous Pashto speaking Afghan in, insurgency. Um, and they have never articulated the same goals as Al Qaeda. So, okay, so just quickly definitionally, but go back to the Obama administration, I'll finish. The central con contradiction in the Obama administration surge, the one that we'll all remember, you know, 2009, 10, 11, 12, when the international troop presence in Afghanistan exceeded 100,000 uh, soldiers. The central contradiction was that the president was very clear our purpose is Al Qaeda. The problem was that Al Qaeda was in Pakistan. That's where Al Qaeda was. I mean, we discovered Osama bin Laden a couple of years later living in Abbottabad, which was not even near the border, but the rest of Al Qaeda was in the federally administered tribal areas or in Karachi or in other places. And, and so the president is, is waging an, an escalating war to contain or defeat Al Qaeda while fighting on the soil of Afghanistan next door where the people with guns are not Al Qaeda, they're the Taliban. And you know, when people would point this out in the deliberations, at least from what I've been able to chronicle from you know, interviews and people's notes and stuff, you know, 
they're not dumb. They recognize this was a contradiction. So then the people said, well, then why are we fighting a war in Afghanistan if Al-Qaeda is in Pakistan? And the answer was, well, if the Taliban revolution succeeds, Al-Qaeda will come back and we'll be back to where we started. So that's why we're fighting the Taliban. Okay. But that's a pretty indirect reason for fighting a war and for asking young American women and men to make the ultimate sacrifice. So it was kind of muddled. It wasn't really articulated that way because it wasn't especially persuasive. So, and here we are. Uh, it didn't work because it wasn't really aligned with a goal that was achievable. Um, and I think the president believed that. The president never thought that the United States was gonna defeat the Taliban in a counterinsurgency war. He was skeptical about it from the beginning. He thought it was possible to get after Al Qaeda and he put pressure on the military leadership to emphasize that. But, but he also bought into the theory of this kind of indirect counterinsurgency war. All right. Um, maybe let's um, stay with this complex relationship to the to the Taliban. So, in um, you've talked before about the fact that there were secret negotiations in the Obama administration going back to 2010 um, with the Taliban to try to create some sort of uh, a deal. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and the way um, that played out going forward into the next two administrations? Yes. Um, so. Um, I think it was uh, evident to the president and to many of his civilian advisors and even to some of his generals that the war was not winnable militarily uh, and that the stalemate that had grown up between 2006 and 2010 or so um, was going to be very difficult to break. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it could be influenced, but it wouldn't be resolved. And so how do wars end uh, when they can't be won on the battlefield? they end through some sort of political settlement. Um, and the idea was to explore um, whether there was a, uh, a settlement with the Taliban that could um, reduce violence in the country and light some kind of pathway uh, out for the United States, um, allow the United States some time to train Afghan security forces and then perhaps ultimately foster a political negotiation between the Taliban and its Afghan opponents about power sharing um, or at least uh, a kind of ceasefire influenced reduction of violence and a greater degree of political stability even if you never have a perfect political settlement or a new constitution or something as grandiose as that. And you know this is this now seems um, naive, but um, it, I don't believe it is, uh, or I don't believe it was um, naive to think that this was achievable if you, if you don't envision a formal political settlement, but your goal is simply to reduce violence and to increase politics, to, to start to transition from war to politics. Even if you don't get all the way there, the only way you're going to start is by talking. And if you look at um, other clearly irreconcilable conflicts, um, such as, for example, the one between uh, Hezbollah and Israel, um, you know, across the Lebanese border, um, even though uh, Hezbollah will never accept Israel's existence and Israel um, will never um, accept Hezbollah as a political partner. Nonetheless, they have negotiated a back channel arrangement that has essentially frozen the conflict uh, in place without shelling for years and years and years and generations of civilians on both sides of the border have grown up in stability. Uh, so, you know, at a minimum, that seemed the purpose of the negotiations with the Taliban. The problem when they started in 2010 was they didn't have a phone number. They didn't, they didn't know anybody in the Taliban. They hadn't talked to the Taliban since the late 90s. And uh, the director had asked Chronicles how it unfolded. I mean, some of it was kind of sadly comical in a way because they really didn't know who they were trying to, to talk to, or they took a long time to determine whether the individual who was representing the Taliban was in fact a credible interlocutor. Uh, they had to do all this testing and confidence building on both sides. And ultimately the negotiation failed um, for reasons that became relevant more recently, which was that the Taliban's goal was 
uh, very clear. They wanted the United States to leave. That's really all they wanted. They would also like some prisoners released, but mainly what they wanted was the United States to leave. And the United States wanted something else. It wanted to leave in the right conditions. Uh, and the conditions were a political settlement between the Taliban and the Afghan government that the United States had supported for so long and, and, that, and that was an ally. And the Taliban refused to talk to the Afghan government. She said, we're, we're not interested in talking to them. They're not legitimate. They, we are the legitimate government of Afghanistan. You unjustly overthrew us back in 2001. And we're prepared to talk to you about your leaving. But, uh, that's, you know, but we're not prepared to talk to these puppets of yours because they're not really even Afghans. They're just puppets of yours. And, and so they got stuck on this for the longest time. And as a result, because the United States was so eager to open this channel with the Taliban for understandable reasons, that, but they made the decision to cut the Afghan government out of the talks and just go one-on-one -on -one with the Taliban. Well, that obviously you know, undermined the pretense that the that Hamid Karzai and then Ashraf Ghani were the sovereign leaders of a democratic Afghanistan. If they're the sovereign government of Afghanistan, then why can't they participate in talks about their own country's future? And the Americans told them you can't because the Taliban don't want to talk to you. And that went on for the longest time. Uh, Karzai blew the talks up over being excluded. And then when the Trump administration came back to them, the Taliban never really changed their position. They said, I, we don't want to talk to the people in Kabul. You can send them down here to Qatar and we'll sit around and look at one another, but we don't regard them as politically legitimate. So the talks remain very bilateral between the United States and the Taliban. And that ended up creating all kinds of problems that led to this, to this spring. Um, yeah, I'll just stop there. Well, yeah. see, my follow-up question is exactly that. That's where we're headed next, right? So uh, the Trump administration uh, regardless of if you're a left, right, or center, they engaged in some very unusual tactics, right? Uh, you have a, a president meeting with a terrorist or an organization that's been deemed a terrorist organization. You have uh, you have terrorists being released uh, who later become now leaders in Afghanistan. Uh, and then you have all of this kind of partisan uh, critique or bickering back and forth about, well, if Trump would have been uh, in, in office last week, or the last two weeks wouldn't have happened the way that it did. Uh, and then you have Biden's own, members of his own party critiquing him and saying, well, you're, you're blaming the people of Afghanistan or you're blaming the government and the military uh, when really this was all inevitable because of this, this deal that Trump put together. So I'm uh, kind of putting all of it out there with, with the overriding question of uh, Donald Trump's role in what's happened in the last two weeks and whether or not it was inevitable given the February 2020 deal. Right. So, I mean, I think the easiest way to get at it is let's just say, let's just review what actually happened, what actually happened. OK, so the Trump administration came in. The president didn't want to fight this war. Right. He made that clear. He said it on Twitter over and over again. But he he assembled a war cabinet that's that persuaded him for two years that he should. Uh, by 28, so they bombed the heck out of the Taliban uh, in 2017 and 2018, really following a path that the Trump that the Obama administration had left them. wasn't a lot of change in war strategy. The war was still a stalemate. The only thing that was different was that they dropped more bombs more heavily, probably killed more civilians um, than in the last part of the Obama years. Then. Um, the president, President Trump decided that he really did want to get out um, of Afghanistan on his watch. And so um, with uh, uh, his secretary of state, Mike Pompeo, uh, he appointed Khalil, um, I mean, um, Zame Khalilzad, who had been a, a negotiator in the Bush years with the Taliban. He's an Afghan American who had a lot of connections and relationships um, in the region as his chief negotiator. So in 2018, the Trump administration starts talking to the Taliban. Khalil Zad goes out there and he really gets very active. Um, the interesting thing is that the Taliban didn't really, didn't, hadn't changed their position from what they had brought to the table with the Obama negotiators, which was, we're not interested in talking to Kabul. Don't talk to us about uh, pushing us into negotiating with these puppets. We're not interested in them. We're interested in two things. We want our prisoners released, and we want uh, you to leave. <laughs> the only thing that was really different was the Trump administration said, believe me, we want to leave. Look, look at, read my president's Twitter feed. He wants to leave, but you got to make it possible for us. We can't leave a mess behind. So 
They went through some negotiations. They made enormous concessions to the Taliban. Um, they released 5,000 prisoners, forced the president uh, of Afghanistan to release prisoners that he did not want to release in order to build the confidence of the Taliban. Um, and the net effect of the negotiation after 2018 was that it strengthened the Taliban's position on the battlefield. The Taliban did make some concessions. They said, we won't attack you, the United States, on your way out. And they also apparently made some annex, secret annex concessions not to stage major attacks on Afghan cities, uh, which they more or less held to, but they started as an assassination campaign against government civil servants and journalists and human rights activists and, and, and other uh, civil society leaders that had the same effect as the kinds of major attacks they used to carry out against cities. So then you get to the formal agreement signed in February 2020 that you mentioned, the last contribution of the Trump administration to this effort to get out of the war. This document was a negotiation between the Taliban and the United States. It didn't involve the government of Afghanistan, the supposedly sovereign government of Afghanistan. And its, prov and its provision was the United States will leave in May 2021. We, we put a date certain on that departure. And there was some things that the Taliban were supposed to do, but they were less concrete. One was that the Taliban were not to cooperate with international terrorist groups like Al Qaeda. Another was that they were not to attack the United States during this transition period. Uh, and the third was that, um, um, that they would, um, you know, forswear these, these um, major attacks. I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting the fourth. All right, in any event, the Taliban made no concrete concessions um, and the US put a hard date on its withdrawal. Uh, the following year, the Biden administration inherits this agreement. Imagine coming in as president, uh, even you know Joe Biden who knew the war, he'd been vice president during eight years of it. Um, you come in, you take office in the circumstances he did after January 6th and you've got the coronavirus crisis and you have big ambitions for domestic policy and you inherit a date, May 2021, either you get out um, on, on May 1 or the Taliban says they're gonna resume attacking US forces. So if you, if you wanna tear up the agreement, you have to go back to war basically. Um, that, was the, that was the basis of his very hasty policy review. He didn't inherit, he didn't create this deadline, he inherited it. Did he have the freedom to throw the agreement out? Absolutely, he did. It was not a treaty ratified by the Senate. It was something that he could have repudiated and he, and he could have even pointed to the failure of the Taliban to live up to their commitments about Al Qaeda because there's lots of evidence that they had not in fact um, challenged Al Qaeda in territory they controlled. Anyway, they didn't even need um, an evidentiary reason. They didn't need a judge to rule on this. They could have just decided we want to do things differently the way Trump decided about the Iran agreement when he came in. But when the president looked at it, um, you know, I think he means very much what he says. He said, look, I've been around this war for a long time. He knew that it's not popular with the American people. Um, he's known that for a long time. Uh, and he has his own conviction that the war is unwinnable. And his own frustration left over from advice he gave during the early Obama administration that was ignored, that the US should not go big in the war, that it should limit its ambitions. He felt the generals kind of rolled over a new president, uh, even though he had a lot of respect for Obama's toughness, you know, that the military kind of snowed everybody with their theories and their advice. And so he decided, I think out of a firm personal conviction that he was gonna be the one to pull the plug. And, um, that's what he's done. I, I do think that the president, you know, I, I, I can see in his record that while he has a, a, an acquaintance with Pakistan and a, and a certain empathy for Pakistani experience for all of its troubles and for all of its challenges from, you know, an American perspective, he, has, he doesn't have a deep personal or empathetic experience of Afghanistan. So I think what's been painful for a lot of us who know Afghanistan is that we see this generation of young people uh, who came of age in the Afghan cities after 2001, protected by NATO security. You know, you've seen them all in the news over the last two weeks. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, the women's robotics team that just landed in Mexico, you know, the 17 year old soccer player who grabbed onto the wheel of a C-17 and fell to his death. 
trying to rescue himself from the prospect of the Taliban. I mean, these are not random people. This is the new generation in Afghanistan. Uh, human rights defenders, journalists, um, civil servants, NGO operators, There's, they're wired, they have phones, they're connected to global culture, they're very nationalistic in their own kind of Afghan way. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that Afghanistan has had in this generation and to watch it be crushed like this. Um, you know, the president has deflected a lot of blame onto Afghans for failing to fight for their country. That's also wrong and offensive. I just will conclude with this. The Afghan security forces took 25 to 30 times as many fatalities in the war as the, as the United States. And most of those occurred after the US drew down in 2014 and handed the war off to the Afghan security forces. To say they, didn't, they don't want to fight for their country, I mean, 60,000 Afghans died uh, and 10,000 a year in the last few years. And to make you wonder, like, how could this have even been sustainable? They stopped fighting because they, they knew the war was over. And the war was over because we decided it was over. That's, that's incredible. Okay. Maybe we'll, we'll close our questions before we take our audience questions uh, by asking you, there's, there's, uh, I'll, I'll just ask like this. So we're seeing new messaging from the Taliban. And I think uh, I'm using the term messaging there, you know, intentionally, which wants to portray them as being, wanting to be part of the international economic and political order. And um, at least some part of the Taliban is arguing that they're gonna rule differently. Um, do you think this is legitimate? Uh, is, it, is it on the level? That's a one, one question. And then uh, I'll, I'll sort of inflect it in a certain way, which is to say, do you think the Taliban has the kind of centralized command and control to prevent the kind of violence and torture and murder that were part of its first regime, even if some central faction does want to rule differently? Yeah, so let's take the second question first. I think the, the the Taliban have more command and control than the former Afghan government did. I mean, they're surprisingly cohesive. Um, they are, their writ does run from the top. Of course, it doesn't run 100%. And, you know, the, the um, regime of training for foot soldiers and so forth leaves much to be um, desired. But an example is that there was a brief uh, nationwide ceasefire called as a confidence building mess uh, message at e mm, two years ago, two, yeah, two, two, two plus years ago uh, during the Trump uh, administration. It was a three day ceasefire and uh, the Taliban agreed to it as, to, as a kind of demonstration project of what a reduction in violence might be like. And it held, I mean, Taliban walked, there wasn't a, there wasn't, there were hardly any reports of Taliban ceasefire violations all across the country. The Islamic State uh, violated the ceasefire, but they didn't sign up for it. Um, and that was really remarkable. And that's not the only example. There are many others, uh, you know, NGOs and the Red Cross, they've been able to work in Taliban areas for a long time, just on the basis of, you know, passes that somebody scrawls out on a piece of paper that says you have a right to go down this road. Now you can talk to the people who drive down those roads. They say, yeah, it works about 95% of the time. Okay. But that's still, that's like more than you would get from the Afghan government uh, as a percentage of cohesion, basically. Um, so, so that's, uh, that's that part. Have the Taliban changed? Uh, what are their intentions? I mean, I think it's, you know, I think we can talk about their record, uh, which I don't, really believe gives much evidence that they've changed. At the same time, um, I think we can observe that they, that they are different than the emirate that fell in 2001. So the, the Taliban, um, how are they different? Three, three quick ways. One, they have new leadership, um, Mullah Muhammad Omar, who was the emir uh, between uh, the rise of the Taliban in 1994 and their fall in 2001, he's deceased. And it's not really clear what kind of collective leadership is going to emerge now. We can see some major figures like Mullah Berader and, and uh, uh, one of the Haqqani's uh, notorious uh, element of the Taliban along the uh, Afghan-Pakistan border. And they have spiritual leadership, who are, spiritual leaders who are less visible. But in any event, you can say for sure they have new leaders. And uh, so we have to figure out who those people are and what they um, intend. The second 
thing that's different is um, that the Taliban are a more international, less provincial movement than they were when they governed last time around. They have a political office in Doha. They have long experience of living in exile in Pakistan, which is part of the world, part of the, um, you know, the sort of internationalism of um, Islamist political and, and religious thinking. So conferences and different ideas and watching the Arab Spring and thinking about the Muslim Brotherhood, these are all experiences that they had in exile that are completely different from their world in, in Afghanistan during the 90s. So, so what does that mean? How will that translate? Does that translate to a different ideology? I'm not certain, but it is definitely a wider perspective than they used to have. And finally, you know, they're, they're more wired, they're more embracing of technology and communication and that this messaging that you refer to is a radical departure from the way they operated in the 90s. When they swept over the country this spring and summer, you know, when, when the vanguard would go into one of the cities that they conquered, the, somebody would be holding up a cell phone, taking videos, showing that the city was theirs and then they would be posting this onto social media instantly They've got press conferences running. Uh, somebody is clearly writing talking points for them. They know what messages they need to get out. Um, now, so what can you rely on? Well, I think we, you know, you can rely on their their record um, is one place to start. They have controlled a lot of the country uh, for a long while. They've controlled, in, you know, districts for more than a decade in some cases. They're not easy to get into. Um, but Afghans who live there and human rights organizations and others that document what's going on in Taliban territory certainly do not uh, paint a picture of a different kind of political economy. It's highly oppressive. Uh, there's a lot of arbitrary detention. Uh, people disappear. They're executed. They continue to arbitrarily execute uh, minorities like the Hazara Shias uh, of Afghanistan. Um, uh, and women have no um, rights um, to work or to education in the rural areas that the Taliban have controlled on and off different places since 2006. Um, they say that they've learned their lesson and that they're going to take a different approach nationally. But I think we have to, one thing we have to really watch over the next few months if we want a, an accurate reading on what Afghanistan is going to endure is the difference between what happens in Kabul where the international community is watching and what happens elsewhere uh, where people can't go. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the messaging even is, has this, this qualified aspect to it that's quite familiar from the 90s, which is, you know, their spokes, sp spokespeople will say, um, we do welcome women into our society. We do welcome uh, women's rights consistent with Islamic law. Okay, yeah. All right, that covers a lot of ground. <laughs> what it, uh, and and based on their interpretations and their record of the record of their interpretations, and 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 the final thing I'd say is that there's no question that the Taliban say one thing and do another. I mean, throughout the last few years, they've been saying that they that they are not um, responsible for assassinations of journalists and human rights defenders and other uh, young civil society types in Kabul and other cities. And uh, the evidence is clear that they are. I mean, there's just no doubt about that. So um, they, they clearly do feel justified in, in covering up their intentions for the sake of public opinion, because that's what they do in some, in some, uh, in some areas. Questions now from uh, Terrell Jones. Uh, We've already touched a bit on this, but if Donald Trump had remained president, what do you think would have unfolded in Afghanistan in May uh, 2021 with a withdrawal or August 2021? I mean, based on the president's statements, I don't think that he would have um, uh, delayed uh, the withdrawal because of the Taliban's failure to, to meet the conditions of um, the February 2020 agreement. I mean, I don't know, but I just, based on everything he said and the and the path that he carved out, I think he would have gone right out the door, um, you know, probably at a pace very similar to the Biden administration. I don't know what kind of national security cabinet he would have had in his second term, but it certainly would not have been the, the holdover sort of um, centrist cabinet that he had in the first two years that slowed him down. It would have been, 
you know, a Trumpist group, um, such as we saw in the last year of his president and presidency, and and they would have done his bidding. Um, would they have taken greater care to protect uh, vulnerable, at-risk Afghans exposed to the Taliban? Um, I, I don't see any record that that he would have because he stopped processing SIV visas for translators and interpreters. Um, you know, last year. Uh, in 2020, um, and and that's also part of the burden that the Biden administration inherited. That this that this notion that okay, as part of the transition, we owe we have a moral obligation to the Afghans who are most at risk and who aided us, um, however misbegotten our cause, they were our partners and they depended on us, and we owe them. And that that whole program was legislated, and and the Trump administration just didn't care about it, apparently, because of it, it, it ran against the grain of their um, immigration policy and their and their and their hostility to refugees uh, general generally. So. Um, so yeah, I think it would have been a, a mess. And I don't see any reason why it would have been better planned uh, than the than the Biden administration's very poor version, uh, which clearly was not um, and not well planned. I mean, you know, there are a lot of reasons why the Biden administration uh, failed to prepare, um, and not all of them are about kind of neglect. But um, you know, obviously, this is uh, if this is a disaster. It is a disaster, and the idea, and and you know, even just taking the politics of it, when the president says as recently as July eighth, you're never going to see a Saigon like helicopters on the roof event in Afghanistan. He said that on July 8th. <laughs> and, you know, um, as I was telling Malik, I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit amped up about this because, you know, with my wife, I've been spending the last few days and nights trying to get people out. And it is, it is a nightmare. And I have been in a lot of conflict zones and navigated a lot of messes uh, one way or another. This is a nightmare. And the, and the idea that there's 6,000 American soldiers sitting in that airport preventing at-risk Afghans from going through the gate because we can't even communicate successfully about what our policy is. And uh, the president is, you know, he just wants clearly, and, you know, politically I can understand why, he just wants to shut this off as fast as possible. He's going to leave a lot of people behind. And, you know, if the Taliban have not changed, uh, there are going to be a lot of a lot of people who are very vulnerable. Okay, we've got a lot of questions and not a lot of time. Uh, some really good ones. Um, let, me, let me just take a quick look here. And okay, so how about um, David uh, Hertog has, has a question here. How will Pakistan's role in Afghanistan evolve in this next act now that the US is gone? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, in the 90s, when the Taliban ruled, Pakistan was one of three countries in the world that recognized the Taliban as the legitimate government of Afghanistan. And um, Pakistan's interest in supporting the Taliban uh, is primarily um, a function of its, of its um, competition with India. Um, it, it wants to deprive India of influence and what the Pakistani military leadership sees as the potential for mischief making um, in Afghanistan. Um, and so they, they kind of push the Taliban forward as their own security perimeter, uh, thinking of India primarily. Um, and so what they want is that influence in Afghanistan, but they also want stability because uh, the last time that the Taliban ruled, it didn't end well for Pakistan, right? So 9-11 led to the US invasion, led to um, intensifying conflict in Afghanistan, that spilled back into Pakistan and Pakistan endured the worst domestic unrest and, and terrorist violence um, in its modern history. As a result of the war in Afghanistan, this was, you know, circa 2008, 2009, 2010, thousands and thousands of people dying when the Pakistani Taliban acquired revolutionary ambitions in Pakistan against the state, against the military. So on the one hand, watch what you wish for. Okay, they've got the Taliban pushed forward against 
you know, the Indians are evacuating, they have influence again. And um, no doubt they'll recognize the Taliban government, try to manage the Taliban government, try to try to benefit from their um, uh, hegemony now in Afghanistan. But the Taliban's rule is unlikely to be stable and its radicalism is unlikely to be contained inside Afghanistan. The Taliban have released a bunch of Pakistani Taliban leaders I saw the other day. Of course, they've released everybody who was imprisoned for, for uh, radical violence. And you know, so they're, going, they're in danger of incubating the same cycle that they suffered from last time around. Um, now the Pakistanis, Pakistani establishment, which is the euphemism used for the, the military, um, of course, they don't, they don't, they never uh, take responsibility for their own errors. They only blame the United States for, for fostering on them. Of course, there's plenty of blame uh, that the United States deserves. But the reality is that this is a Frankenstein strategy, you know, riding the Frankenstein monster, thinking that they can control events, that they have, that their record is poor. They, they don't get it right. And they have suffered the blowback again and again. And I think there's every, if I were a Pakistani citizen, I would be very worried about what lies ahead as a result of this, you know, victory of Pakistani policy. Yeah. Uh, Steve, uh, second to last question from Kyle Estes, in, who's a professor in the Department of Politics here. Um, they write, as a scholar with a significant focus on post-Central, uh, sorry, post-Soviet Central Asia, uh, they're interested in a potential for spillover of the Taliban and associated Islamist groups beyond Afghanistan's borders. To what extent do you think this is a valid concern? And importantly, what role do you think the US might and should play in responding to this threat? I mean, I think it is a, con it is a valid concern. Um, and the reason is that the Taliban haven't really changed their ideology. Um, they, they are not an expansive movement, right? So they, they really do see themselves as, a, as an Afghan uh, nationalist. That's probably not an appropriate word, but you get the idea, an Afghan movement. And um, yet they feel bound by their understanding of Islamic law to um, provide hospitality and comradeship to other righteous Muslims um, that share their outlook um, on apostasy as they would see Shiism and on um, you know the the West and and um, and other non-islamic governments in the region and and so their their record is that they have neither the will nor the capacity to prevent expansive elements um, some of them international from using Afghanistan under their rule to to pursue ambitions in 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 neighboring states, particularly Tajikistan will be vulnerable. Um, you know, you guys, you, you scholars know the current situation in, in some of these states better than I do. Um, but um, all, of the, all of the neighbors, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, and Kyr Kyr Kyrgyzstan are vulnerable. And um, uh, the United States will, I think, what, what can the United States do about it? It will seek to support those uh, governments um, and to compete with Russia for influence around the common agenda of preventing cross-border terrorism. Um, you know, the Chinese are in an interesting position. So one of the things that's really different about this time around compared to the 90s is that China is not the same country. Um, you know, what is Pakistan's closest ally in the world? China. What is China's closest ally in the world? Pakistan, actually. I mean, they have a very deep and longstanding uh, relationship. And, and um, so what, but the Chinese are um, concerned, to put it blandly, about um, uh, terrorism in their own far west. Uh, they've, in, you know, they've interred a million Uyghurs um, out of the pretense of counterterrorism. And they know that Afghanistan has been a refuge um, and, and an incubator of some Chinese uh, radical Islamist groups. Um, you know, their response is way out of proportion to the threat, but it's not to say there are never cross-border problems between China and Afghanistan. So um, China is going to be in a very difficult uh, position. Pakistan will want Chinese cover to justify its influence with the Taliban and to want to bring China in 
to legitimize the Taliban and to and to realize the economic potential of whatever the Taliban dictatorship can achieve. And China will be tempted by that, but it will also be wary of the ideology that it is now through its partnership with Pakistan lashed to because it's that's not its policy either. So I think that's probably the biggest difference from the 90s as I've tried to think it through at least you know very quickly, which is that um, China has a completely different set of capabilities and interests or a very different set of capabilities and interests in Central Asia than it did um, last time around. I don't quite know what that implies, but I, I do feel like that, that that is a true observation. Um, okay, so for more on the Uyghur question, by the way, you can go to our YouTube channel. We had a really good panel on it this, in the spring. Um, that's a great tie-in, very important one. So we'll just end on this. We have so many good questions we're going to uh, not be able to get to, but we'll end on this. So I'll take this version of it. What's the best way for U.S. citizens and other people ask students, faculty, you know, lay people to help the Afghani people, Afghani people? Are there particular NGOs or charities we should focus on? Is there, are there people we should be pressuring, things we should be asking for? Well, I think there are three crises that we should all, you know, feel involved in uh, in the coming months and years. Um, and one is uh, refugee resettlement. Um, so supporting organizations that um, are working with um, Afghans as they arrive uh, here and in other countries um, to make sure that they're not neglected and that they have a path forward. Um, second, Afghanistan is going to have a, a massive humanitarian crisis as a result of this. Uh, it's already unfolding. Um, it was already a precarious uh, year because of uh, the coronavirus. And um, so looking to those NGOs that are providing um, food and medicine on the ground effectively, you know, pick your favorites, um, you know, Medecins Sans Frontieres usually steps up in these situations. There's bunches of others. Um, and uh, that they do have a record of having worked partially successfully um, with the Taliban government in the 90s. And I imagine the Taliban will need that international humanitarian capacity to avoid an outright disaster um, over the next year. So they, they, they need our support. In terms of the crisis that's unfolding right now, I mean, I would name, I mean, you know, we're, we're involved with a bunch of different organizations just trying to charter planes. Um, you know, I never thought about what it takes to charter an Airbus uh, to North Macedonia before. Um, it costs a lot. Uh, a lot of people have come in with big, big contributions to make this airlift possible um, in addition to whatever the US government is doing. Um, but I think that's going to be over before we know it. Um, there are certainly, for, you know, if you think about uh, the women who are at risk, human rights defenders who are at risk, journalists who are at risk, the international organizations that generally advocate on behalf of such vulnerable folks are places to consider. See, you know, Committee to Protect Journalists is one high on my list. Um, uh, but, you know, all those organizations right now are on the ground in Kabul trying to get people on planes um, because they all have networks there and every one of their clients is, is in their, you know, WhatsApp or Signal or uh, email channels saying, please get me the heck out of here. And I'm afraid the clock is ticking. I'm, you know, from what I'm reading today, it's going to be over on Friday. So, wow. um, yeah. Wow. Uh, Steve, thank you so much. You've been this is incredible. It's an incredible um, set of answers during a very difficult time. Uh, we spoke a little bit at the beginning uh, about that. Um, my best to you, your friends, your family, wishing the best for them. Let us know if we can help. Uh, I don't know how, but if we can. Um, and we can send around. If you find there are groups that you'd like for us to send around, we'd be happy to do that and get the word out. Um, and thanks for coming back to Oxy and talking to the community, not just this time, but all the times in the past. Um, so if you have any final words you wanted to say before you go. No, just thanks for having me. I mean, of course, you know, I, I whenever Oxy calls, I try to say yes, because it's a big part of my life. And, uh, you know, we can all joke about liberal arts education and what it's good for, but mine is just, you know, defining for, for the way I was able to live in the world. So I'm very grateful to Oxy and uh, always happy to be helpful in any way I can. Thank you so much, Steve. We'll be back on the second on Thursday. And then again, next week, we'll keep following the story. Our best to all of you. Thanks again, Steve. Thank Bye. you.